Hi guys, Paolo here from Athletic IQ. Today, I'm going to be interviewing someone who I've been wanting to interview for so long, and that's Alan Aragon. He's one of the most respected nutritional leaders in the industry. Today, he's here as part of his Australian tour. Uh, he's just done his Sydney leg and he's gonna be doing it. He's gonna be doing the Melbourne tour uh, later on this week. Um, by the time you get this video, some of you guys would have already seen that tour, and so today might be a bit of a recap, but it's gonna be awesome. Um, firstly, let me introduce Alan Aragon. Okay, welcome welcome to Sydney, Alan. Uh, how are you enjoying your stay? Oh, I've been really enjoying it quite a lot. Um, yeah. I did the bridge climb, which was quite an experience, and cool. I also uh, ate some kangaroo at the VIP dinner after the first seminar there, so. You've tried kangaroo? Yes, yes. What it, did you think of it? It was, it was nice and lean and clean. Clean, was it paleo though? Uh, it was paleo friendly. So <laughs> that, that was the whole theme of, of my tour is the paleo friendly tour of Australia. Right, right. It was titled a little differently earlier on. It was the Alan Aragon uh, Australian tour. Yes, <laughs> um, yes. So you've just completed the Sydney seminar, which I, I've been to, and it was absolutely fantastic. And you're uh, you. well on your way to do the Melbourne leg. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people will enjoy that. Let me lead into some questions now um, and, and carry on with this interview. Something mm -hmm. that I really picked up on uh, during your talk was the mindset of a scientist. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you talk to us about having a scientific mindset and I guess the different types of scientific studies and research that's published ranging from you know abstracts to meta-analysis mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, and, and help the lay person um, differentiates you know science from as you put it science from BS <laughs> when they yeah. look at diets. Yeah this is a real minefield for the lay person because they don't really have anywhere to go besides um, perceived authority in terms of what they want to believe or what they you know what they don't believe mm -hmm. so it's it's really difficult one of the things that the lay person can just right off the bat understand is that uh, most news stories even in scientific news stories or studies that are uh, pushed out into the lay press they are almost always sensationalized in some way shape or form mm -hmm. um, it, they're almost always twisted into some sort of uh, story that's designed to tug at people's emotions rather than what is what's presented in the actual study which is usually some modest kind of effect that's really kind of unspectacular uh, the study's got a bunch of uh, flaws and limitations that the researchers themselves would acknowledge and so yeah. you know everything gets kind of twisted into this major story so one, one thing that the lay public needs to understand is that the type of research that usually makes headlines is observational research and what I mean by that is uh, research that is not a controlled experiment okay. it's typically just a look at some sort of phenomenon going on with a population and they just, uh, the researchers attempt to draw correlations between some sort of thing like, you know, like a given food and the, they try and draw some association between that and some kind of uh, disease state like diabetes or yeah. cancer or heart disease and that's that whole thing. So they have to understand, you know, things that make headlines, it's observational data, it's not controlled. So there's really no cause and effect established mm -hmm. there. And the lay public, I guess without being trained formally in the sciences, what they can just kind of adopt is a skeptical mindset. In other words, they need to just not believe until the evidence is consistent and compelling. Right. So not really give in to the fear mongering basically, isn't it? Yes. Yes. There's a lot of that going on. Yes. Yeah. That's uh that's that's wide uh, widespread in the fitness industry, so mm -hmm. Look, while we're on the subjects of uh, diets and BS, I suppose the, the, the next thing I want to do is I want to crush some diet myths with you. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go through a few different um, topics that I'd like you to sort of, um, I guess, um, you know, put your, put your uh, 
experience into. Okay. So there's a lot of alarmism that goes on in the industry. Mm -hmm. Some of that will be sugar, paleo, organic food, mm -hmm. artificial sweeteners, um, and eating to boost hormones. Mm. So maybe we could uh, go through that one by one, if that's okay with you. So the first yeah. thing we'd, we'd cover off is sugar. Okay. Why should people not be scared of sugar? <laughs> well, in, in the beginning, any time that you put a, a an evil or a void stamp on any type of food, then you automatically raise its mystique, and you actually make the food more attractive, sort of like uh, some kind of forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Mm. And so when you when you give a single stupid food that kind of power, then you set people up for a neurotic relationship with food. You set people up for the potential to binge on a given food because they think, oh, this is this is a bad food, ah, and they're secretly drooling over it, you know, yeah. when no one's looking. So the whole thing about sugar and I quit sugar and I, you know, I whatever it is. Can I can I get dirty over here? Absolutely. Go for <laughs> I, I quit masturbating to sugar. Right. You know, <laughs> exactly. it's like, it's, come on, man, get get a life already and uh, learn a bit about moderation. Learn a bit about uh, the idea that you can pretty much have anything as long as you don't have it in excess all the time. Yeah. And so sugar falls into that category. Uh, a lot of people blame sugar for the downfall of humanity when the data really isn't there. Now, it's, it's tough to actually track uh, you know, population-wide sugar intake for any length of time, let, let alone tracking it since the beginning of the uh, uh, obesity epidemic, mm -hmm. which started in roughly, oh, the 70s and really kind of kicked up in the 80s. And, um, and people mistakenly just uh, blame sugar for obesity and diabetes and heart disease when there's a lot of other factors that occurred um, across the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and the 2000s, yeah. and a lot of um, a lot of variables uh, go unaccounted for, and people just selectively choose sugar as the one thing that mm -hmm. caused it, which is completely false. There are other factors, such as a big one being a sedentary shift, right. um, physical inactivity, just pervasive, um, the internet, uh, yeah. labor labor saving devices. Uh, and also the increase in other types of foods like added fats and oils, um, uh, increase in grains, especially refined grains. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can't selectively choose sugar as the bad guy because then, you, you know, you're getting a whole false picture and you're giving sugar too much power. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I think, I think part of the problem is um, that people try to pigeonhole the problem into one aspect of mm -hmm. society when really it's... It's a holistic approach, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Not, it's not just sugar. It's it's not just over availability of crappy products or whatever. It's actually everything all at once. People not moving enough and all mm -hmm. that. So, yep. yeah, I absolutely get that. Now, um, something that we discussed at the workshop mm -hmm. was uh, uh, a particular celebrity's um, take on <laughs> paleo. <laughs> So I wanted to talk to you about that, and um, I mean I know that we we uh, asked uh, asked for him to uh, to debate you, and, and without success, unfortunately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, as, as you know, I was expecting. Uh, I knew that wasn't going to happen anyway. Sure. Um, what What's the story with paleo? What What What's going wrong with it? Well, paleo. It, at the core is this romantic idea that we can kind of get back to nature, get back to our roots, get back to our prehistoric habits. And the leap of faith and the leap of logic there is that things were great <laughs> in the uh, Paleolithic era. Um, things were, and, and our health was great and, you know, we had strong bones and strong bodies and, uh, you know, a lower... Uh, incidence and uh, lower prevalence of disease and all this stuff and um, you know fact of the matter is um, none of that is true necessarily at least in the general sense and uh, secondly the whole idea that there's a single paleolithic diet that excludes grains legumes and dairy mm -hmm. is really not true according to the data 
You know, when, when you look at the different geographical locations, people just ate what was available. Yeah. And there was a wide, wide variation in the types of foods that were available in various geographic locales. And so the idea that there's a single paleo diet is false from the start. Right. And secondly, there's archaeological data quite a bit piling up now showing that uh, humans ate grains. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And then they, they tend to uh, shape paleo to, to their own personal bias too, don't they? Absolutely, yeah. There's, paleo is kind of evolving into this, this animal that, okay, well, uh, it's paleo plus dairy, and you know, we'll call it primal. <laughs> and then some people are like, oh, I do paleo, but I eat uh, non-gluten grains. Right. <laughs> and so, right. yeah, paleo so is paleo definitely... paleo all week, but I'm okay to have a beer on the weekend. Bam, that's right, that's <laughs> right. Al alcohol, you know, yeah. somehow not paleo, or rather alcohol is paleo when you want it to be paleo. Right. Exactly. So the, the whole thing is absolutely silly. And then paleo it puts the avoid stamp on various foods, and even foods like legumes, you know, where's the data on, on the health dangers of legumes? Oh, wait a minute, it's, it's not there. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. God, uh, you know, Asians have been uh, living off, off legumes for so long, and I know that you touched on blue zones, yeah. having one mm -hmm. of those uh, commonalities as well. Yep. Um, you know, so it's, it's definitely a healthy food, if you want to put it that way. Sure, um, sure, yeah. Yeah, the, the whole uh, restricting of foods uh, because of some you know, because of somebody's romantic ideal and uh, there, there's so many fallacies with paleo that it would just take a whole day to really kind of go through them. Absolutely. And people have to realize that, well, a lot of times people need to be part of a community. Mm -hmm. And so if it means going on a silly ass diet like paleo, well then they'll do it. So. Absolutely, yeah. That, that's a big problem too. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll move on and I'll, do, I'll go through this a little bit quicker. but. Um, Organic food versus GMOs. Okay. Let's, okay. let's get your take on that. All right, all right. Um, the, the literature on organic food, by and large, um, shows that organic food is not necessarily safer, mm -hmm. nor is it more nutritious than conventionally produced foods. And the evidence uh, behind the GM, GM crops, GM foods, etc., same story. You know, there is a very consistent safety record for GMOs and of course people will say oh Monsanto this and this and that and you know I, I would just say to those folks you know just pull your thong out of your butt and just <laughs> relax man you know because the data isn't there to, to support the alarmism Excellent. and uh, it's like a first world problems complaint. And if someone were to look for a study um, again um, supporting these sort of things. You can always look for a bias, I understand that. But if yeah. you were to look for a fair study, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure they could go to your site and find credible links yeah. to support what you're talking about as mm -hmm. well. And we'll put uh, Alan's links and site onto, um, onto the notes. Okay, so um, from there, I guess let's cover off uh, artificial sweeteners and the, the phobia mm -hmm. to artificial sweeteners. Yeah, artificial sweeteners is another target um, People tend to be anti-technology, you know, whether it's uh, whether it's pharmaceuticals or um, whether it's even supplements, uh, and then um, artificial sweeteners is one of those things. But just because it's something that hasn't been around since our, our Paleolithic ancestry, <laughs> it's got to be bad. Well, you know, planes and the internet ha weren't around either, but mm. we're we're doing okay. <laughs> um, uh, artificial sweeteners have recently been blamed for things like diabetes and even things like obesity. But once again, um, there have been some recent systematic reviews and meta-analyses looking at uh, the effect of artificial sweeteners on body weight regulation. And in fact, they do help with weight loss and weight maintenance, contrary to uh, some, you know, some people's beliefs. And, mm -hmm. and the, the, uh, the research linking um, artificial sweeteners with overweight or obesity are typically observational data where it's probably a case of reverse causality where people get overweight or get obese and then they seek out ways to mitigate their the condition through artificial sweeteners. It's not the artificial sweeteners that caused the obesity. Yeah, yeah. so it's a correlation, yeah. not causation. Right, right. I remember looking at the study that you're talking about and I think the ratio, um, there was one particular incident where they did the study with rats and it did cause 
uh, in one circumstance an issue with one of the with the rats right uh, mm -hmm. but the ratio of aspartame to you know to concentration was something like 16,000 to 1 so you know by all means if you want to drink a swimming pool of diet coke or or diet pepsi or something like that then maybe maybe you might be in a bit of trouble but sure um, excess in anything, even artificial, artificial sweeteners, can, can be an issue. So. Exactly, exactly. And the, the problem is excess. It's not actually that particular, uh, that particular uh, ingredient per se. Right. So just, I, I guess, finally for me today, what we'll talk about now is mm -hmm. just um, uh, eating specific foods to boost your hormones. I know that some people have seen coaches out there who encourage them to eat um, a specific food and that, that that particular thing must be in their diet like a broccoli to boost testosterone for example <laughs> what are your take on, what's your take on that i think that attempts to manipulate hormones in particular ways with, with diet is um i think it's pretty futile for the most part yep um of course there are ways to mess up your hormones through diet i mean for example uh, you can consume, chronically consume a diet that is just uh, excessively low in total dietary fat, mm. you know, sub 20%, sub 10% all the time and, um, you know, trying to avoid saturated fat and then testosterone levels can drop. But as far as saying, okay, well, you got to eat these particular foods in order to get the, you know, the testosterone up and like the broccoli example and it's like, hmm. Um, the end to which people recommend that is to affect body composition somehow. Yeah. And so these these fluctuations of testosterone within the physiological limits, you know, there's really no reliable uh, correlation with with changes uh, or enhancements in body composition when yeah. when you're looking at those those um, those relatively small changes. Right. So, I would say, instead of focusing on on hormones. Mm -hmm. Focus on, gosh, focus on things like uh, what would increase muscle protein synthesis. Yeah. Focus on things that would, um, you know, uh, uh, affect body fat loss. Mm -hmm. And then marry those, those dietary uh, protocols with the right training. Right. And because hormonal changes are going to happen whether you kind of like it or not, they happen in the background constantly all the time. Yeah. And you can't control everything you think you can control. But you know, there's a lot of gimmickry that can come out of attempting to do that. So I, I would, I would take the focus off of that and put it on things that we uh, can actually, concretely actually. manipulate. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So never put the, uh, never put the cart before the horse, as Eric Helms would say, right? Yep, that's right. Yeah. So good old Eric. <laughs> Shout out, Eric Helms. Yeah, he's a cool, dude. So um, for today, for this section of the uh, the interview, that's that's me. On the next part, I'm going to introduce our sponsored athlete, Robbie Frame, which will come in part two of the series. Um, he'll interview Alan uh, with a topic that you might be interested in, which is nutrient timing, which Alan has extensive research on. So, <laughs> Robbie the phenom. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, Alan. Thanks for, thanks for the, uh, this interview, and uh, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much, Paulo. Thanks. <laughs>